Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to CE Elevated, a CSU Vet CE webinar series. I'm your host, Jason Bledorn, coming to you live from Fort Collins and Colorado State University. And I'd like to thank you for joining us on behalf of CSU Vet CE here at the Translational Medicine Institute. We've named this webinar series CE Elevated, symbolic of our Colorado mountainous terrain, as well as our mission to provide you with an elevated experience in all CSU Vet CE courses and activities. We believe there is great power in the collision between inspired learners, engaged educators, and meaningful experiences. Tonight, we're sincerely thankful for the support of Jorvet, who has made this webinar episode possible. Okay, tonight, we are joined by my friend and longtime mentor in the orthopedic world. I'm very honored to have this experience to introduce Dr. Ross Palmer. Um, Dr. Palmer is a board certified orthopedic surgeon. His career has spanned both private practice and academia. Uh, he founded and owned a mobile veterinary surgical practice in the Monterey Bay region of California and had the opportunity to work in many different general practices at that time. Here at CSU, he's a professor of orthopedic surgery and is a director of education in our Translational Medicine Institute. Ross has recently served as president of the Veterinary Orthopedic Society and has been named an honored mentor by the American College of Veterinary Surgeons and Speaker of the Year at VMX in Orlando. He's lectured and taught hands-on laboratories around the world. Um, I'm one of those proud learners and uh, thankful to join him here at CSU. Um, and tonight he's gonna share with us his perspectives on tuning up our everyday orthopedic skills, specifically the use of orthopedic bandages, bandages and splints. So without further delay, I'll turn this session over to you, Ross and we'll listen attentively. Thanks, Jason. It's it's a pleasure to be with everybody tonight. You know, so often I'm with you in the role of host, and tonight uh, I have the privilege of being able to present to you. So let me go ahead and see if I can call my uh, slides up here for you. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I'm particularly excited this evening because so often what we find is we get excited about new surgical techniques. We get excited uh, about new hardware or fixation systems. And sometimes that comes at the expense of us just refining our everyday skills. And, and so we're going to have a two-part series on our everyday orthopedic skills. And tonight we're going to talk about our first aid bandaging and splinting skills and the importance of those. We like to talk about our conflicts of interest in work and here are some of the conflicts of my interest at work uh, is, is sometimes I would like to be out here and doing some of these things in our great outdoors. Um, the other, only other conflicts of interest that I have this evening uh, are that I will be teaching some seminars that I'll, I'll share some information about those, um, but some hands-on training uh, seminars here at the Translational Medicine Institute. So there's a spry young Dr. Palmer. I don't wanna say how many years ago, but over the many years between that picture and today, I've had the opportunity to put on an awful lot of bandages and splints. And I think I've helped a lot of patients with those skills, but I'm, I'm also certain that I, there's some that I've harmed. And, and I, what I wanna do is use our time together to begin to share with you some of the experiences of what I've learned and little nuances and tricks that help me to uh, have more success uh, and fewer complications with my coaptation skills. I want you to, for a moment, stop and look at these radiographs not as a learner and not as a veterinarian, but imagine that these are your limbs or imagine that these are the limbs of ve your very own pet. And suddenly what you realize when you look at these radiographs through that lens is, is what that first aid clinician, that primary care clinician, what that person does and how they go about doing the management of these injuries that you have or your beloved pet has uh, really matters, okay? And so it's not just an academic exercise, it's, it's that we look at what we do every day through the lens of our patients. 
And if it matters for these sorts of patients that I'm showing, imagine how much more important those skills become for a patient such as this shown in the middle. So we're going to talk about coaptation, and, and coapt means nothing more than to approximate or to fit together or to fasten, and that's kind of the root word for coaptation, which then refers to uh, a mobilization of a limb with the use of some sort of external sling, bandage, splint, or cast, and that can really be done in any of three of or, or for any of three different purposes one is as a temporary sort of first aid immobilization in preparation for some definitive surgical fixation so maybe you're not going to do the surgery but you're caring for that pet just like you know we empathized with that patient a few slides ago you're making sure you take the very best care of that patient in preparation for their definitive surgical fixation and even if you are going to do that definitive surgical fixation, you're wanting to, again, help bridge the gap between where the patient is today and what you're going to see in your operating room in the next day or two. Sometimes coaptation is used as a definitive therapy. And then a third thing is sometimes it can be, and this is a less common indication, but as an ancillary support to some sort of surgical fixation. This evening, out of interest of time, we're going to focus primarily on the use of coaptation as a temporary first aid immobilizer in preparation for our definitive surgical fixation. So what my goal is, is that in this session, what you're going to learn is some indications for first aid immobilization, that we talk a little bit about use of a Robert Jones bandage versus the use of a splint in these first aid applications. And then we talk about even amongst splinting, there's a lot of different splinting materials that you can choose from. What are those options? And, and then what do I recommend? And what are some of the nuances of using some of those different materials so that we can leverage their advantages and, and minimize some of their disadvantages? And then, and then we'll go through some of the application techniques and tips for these three bandages and splints. So Robert Jones bandage, a, comfort, uh, a custom temporary slab splint, um, and the spica splint. And then finally, talk just a little bit about aftercare for the patient and client education. So starting off with first aid immobilization, some of the keys to success are obviously, but it has to be stated, is save the patient first. And so, you know, I'm an orthopod. I want to do my very best to save the limb, do everything I can to protect that limb. But it's important that we attend to the patient first, right? Because uh, there is no patient to treat if we're not saving the life of the patient. Second of all, and we're not going to talk as much about this this evening, but we certainly do in our courses, is the proper first aid wound management. So sometimes as a component of these orthopedic injuries, there's wounds that need to be managed. And how we manage those wounds um, is extremely important. And then the last thing is, is obeying important bandaging principles. And we're going to spend a fair amount of time talking about that. So our indications for first aid immobilization are, uh, first of all, open wound management. So a, without any bony abnormalities, any bony injuries, just using bandaging to manage an open wound can be uh, an important indication. Another is to maintain our closed reduction of joint luxation. So, for instance, if we reduce an elbow luxation and we want to maintain that closed reduction, we may use a spica splint to help maintain that reduction. And then our first aid management of, of fractures distal to the elbow and stifle, and then perhaps using a spica for selected fractures proximal to the elbow and stifle, at least as a temporary or first aid immobilizer. We have to remember the principle, and, and this is so simple, and yet this is, this is a common error that we see, is we need to remember to immobilize the joint above and below the fracture. So let's take this first uh, photo on the left. So if this splint or bandage were applied to immobilize a tibial fracture, then it, it really isn't a very good solution, is it? Because it's not bridging the stifle joint. So I would even take this statement of immobilizing the joint above and below the fracture, I'd actually take it a step further 
and I would say immobilize as much of the limb segment proximal to that joint above as you can. So it's not just getting a few centimeters above the joint, but as much of that limb segment proximal to the joint above, um, the, the better off you're going to be. Now, in this example of the purple bandage, again, if this is a tibial fracture, then this is a more appropriate splint or bandage because it does span that stifle joint and a substantial portion of that limb segment proximal to the stifle joint. We will talk a little bit about spica splints and the technique for building and applying a spica splint. I don't want to mislead anybody into believing that I use a spica splint on every one of my humerus fractures or every one of my femoral fractures. But where I do use them and where I think it is a handy skill is, is there are instances where maybe you have a patient who has two femoral fractures and and now it is going to be a day or two before they get to surgery that's really a very difficult situation to be in so i might consider a spica splint to give the patient one limb at least to stand on another place i might use a spica splint is when there's just going to be a protracted delay until surgery you know in in instances where let's again we'll go with the example of i have a unilateral femoral fracture and this patient is uh, sedated and they're being managed with analgesic medications and I'm going to get to surgery tomorrow. I'm probably not going to apply a spica splint, but if due to other complicating factors, it may be a, a number of days before the patient gets to surgery, then it might be a good idea to consider a spica splint. And that's particularly true if there's going to be lengthy travel required before they can get to the specialist surgeon. So there are instances where, say, a patient is from Colorado, but they're visiting friends or family in Montana, and they're 14 hours away, and they're going to be staying overnight, and they're going to be in and out of the car and in and out of the hotel or something in transit um, to our clinic. It then, again, might make sense to apply a spica splint. What are the benefits of immobilization? Assuming we do appropriate immobilization, one of, the, one of the key benefits is comfort. So go back to that slide where, where we imagined that those fractured limbs were our, were our own. I mean, one of the things I'm going to want as the patient is, is I'm going to want you to immobilize that floppy, unstable limb for my comfort, if, if for nothing else. Another benefit is that it's going to minimize the swelling and the bruising that is associated with the injury. If I have any sharp cortical segments of, of bone, um, they are at risk of penetrating the skin and taking a closed injury and making it an open injury. But again, if I can do a nice job with my coaptation, I can prevent that from happening. Um, if there are open wounds, it helps to protect those open wounds, right? And in the end, it makes for a happy patient and it makes for a happy surgeon. So the less soft tissue swelling there is for the surgeon to work with, chances are the better job that they're going to do. And I've got an example that I'll show you here in a minute. But, but that's what we want, right? We want happy patients. We want happy uh, health care teams for our patients. So if we direct our attention to the images on the right. Everybody loves to see metal, right? And everybody wants to give the surgeon a big pat on the back. But the reality is, is the, is the stage was set for this nice outcome by what was done on admission of this patient. So first saving the life, first managing any open wounds, and then immobilizing that fracture so that it doesn't become any further displaced, so that we minimize swelling, so that the closed injury remains a closed injury. And then one of the things the surgeon was able to do in this particular case is apply this as a percutaneous plate. They made a little incision distally, uh, slid the plate up along the medial surface of the tibia, applied some screws in the proximal segment through a little incision, applied those screws through into the distal segment through that uh, entry incision. And all of that stage was set because you did such a great job 
preparing that patient for referral. So you deserve a great part of the, the congratulations because you were a key part of that healthcare solution. So now talking about preferences between splinting versus a Robert Jones bandage, I think oftentimes it, it is a function really. They both can be used successfully. Oftentimes it's, it's a matter of available supplies. You know, what do you have available to you in your clinic? And then to a degree, personal preference. Are you more comfortable handling splinting materials? Or are you more comfortable with some of the unique challenges of handling large cotton rolls? And we'll talk about some of those uh, unique challenges that, that really nobody ever seems to talk about. So here's just a slide showing some of the supplies that are needed to have on hand to apply a Robert Jones bandage. And, and one of the things that I try to do is to accumulate my materials ahead of time so that I'm not, you know, half of the way through the bandage and now running for more supplies, etc. Um, I, I mentioned this surgical sleeve uh, as an option uh, uh, to protect the bandage, and that's not so much protecting a bandage from rain outside, you know, wet ground, but sometimes we do have those patients who, you know, they're just going to dribble urine and things on their bandage. So if I can use an impervious surgical sleeve just to keep the dog from dribbling urine on his own bandage, maybe that's an instance where that's a, a very inexpensive, very accessible, very affordable solution. But if I've got a patient who, who really I, I wit, live in a very wet climate, then I'm probably going to use something uh, like an impervious booty or a plastic bag. And I'll show some, some photos of those things a little bit later. So talking about management of these thick cotton rolls, I don't necessarily know why, but they come in this funny sort of sushi roll surrounded by paper. And so one of the first things that you oftentimes have to do is unroll all that paper and get it out of the way. Then another challenge that people have in working with these bulky cotton rolls is sometimes it's just too much bulk. I mean, yes, we're looking for a bulky bandage, but I'm dealing with a smaller patient and it's just a little bit too much bulk. Realize that you can take that thick cotton roll and you literally can take the end and you can begin to separate it so that you can split its thickness. So you can see in the, the photograph in the middle, I'm doing exactly that. I'm creating two rolls uh, of, of essentially half the thickness of the original roll. Other times we find, okay, it's, it's the appropriate thickness, but it's, it's just too wide. I'm dealing with a, a, a beagle, not a, not a Great Dane or something like that, and it's just too wide of a roll. It's, it's really cumbersome to try to cut these thick cotton rolls. Instead, what tends to work better is just yank on them, just pull them, and they'll actually pull apart, and you can accomplish in a few seconds what would take you uh, days sometimes to do with scissors uh, or scalpel, etc. All right, so let's kind of go through this step by step and, and talk a little bit about the principles, and then we'll use a video to illustrate it as well. But, but all of our bandages essentially are going to start with tape stirrups. Most of the time, those are applied medially and laterally, but there may be times you have wounds on those surfaces, and so maybe those stirrups in some patients have to be applied cranially or caudally. That, that can be the case. Typically, we are going to be bandaging the up leg, the uppermost leg, as you see here. Now, one of the principles in putting any of our layers upon the limb is to what I call wrap like a snail. So imagine this cotton roll is a snail. I'm handling the shell, and, and this cotton that you see on the limb is the gooey body coming out from the shell. So we wrap like a snail, not like a drunken snail where, the, where the, the shell is upside down. And again, you'll see that again on the video and that'll make more sense. Typically with each of the layers and especially with this gauze layer, we're going to go for about a 50% overlap. And, and a, particularly with a Robert Jones bandage, there is a lot of torque being applied to the limb with my left hand or with the, the, uh, the bandager's left hand. That's not my left hand. but um, So a lot of torque with the left hand 
And so the bandager and the assistant, in this case, my hands are the assistant, I am applying a counter torque in the opposite direction. So we don't get a twist in the limb, right? If it's my limb, I don't want it to be twisted 180 degrees, so my paw is now pointing backwards. Usually we do the 50% overlap, but sometimes I find that a crisscross pattern works better. If I'm having trouble getting some of the lumps and bumps out of the bandaging, then I'll adopt a crisscross pattern. So then you can see what we end up with is relatively uniform compression. And then I will go to securing the stirrups um, as the last step before my final layer. And that's pretty much true of any of the bandages we'll show, and, and you will see that. One of the things I like to do is to use elastican strips to basically seal all of the cotton elements up into the bandage. Dogs and cats seem to love to chew at that cotton, and so that uh, those elastican strips will help with that. I think probably, um, well, uh, let, let me show this, and then we'll go to a video. But um, with the outer layer of vet wrap, it's, it's really important with most of our bandages to make sure that we don't get vet wrap too tight. However, because there's so much bulky padding with a Robert Jones bandage, I actually will apply vet wrap snug as long as I have adequate padding underneath because the goal is to create that thick padding and convert it to a nice compressed bandage around the limb. And so sometimes I will apply some tension to the vet wrap, but only with my Robert Jones bandages. And in the end, it ought to thump a bit like a ripe melon. So we'll show a little video here. Wrap. Okay, we talk about. And so here we're talking about wrapping like a snail. So what we don't want to do is flip that bad boy upside down like a drunken snail. And the reason for that is when we wrap like a snail, we can control the tension within that cotton roll. Um, and, and so we're, we're more able to apply an appropriate degree of tension when we wrap like a snail. So we're starting at the very distal end of the limb with only the center two toes uh, protruding slightly as is going to be true of most of our circumferential bandages. And as I mentioned before, I'm applying with my left hand quite a bit of torque on the limb. So my right hand is applying a counter torque so that I don't twist the limb. That's what I'm showing there with my right hand is applying that counter torque. Now, Let's imagine in this scenario that we're applying a Robert Jones bandage for first aid immobilization of a, a radius ulna fracture. And so if that is the case, if we're treating a, uh, a radius ulna fracture, we need to make sure that we bridge as much of that segment proximal to the elbow joint as, as is possible. So your decision, do you need more bulk um, I think, yeah, let's go ahead and add a little bit more bulk. And so again, that's going to be a case by case decision, but to get to being a true Robert Jones, we want a fair amount of bulk for the next layer. So again, wrapping like a snail, fair amount of tension being applied. You really are not going to get this layer too tight. If, if you're pulling so tight, that you're afraid it's too much tension, what's actually gonna happen is you're just gonna tear the roll. So, so most people, I would say, get this layer too loose. So apply it nice and snug to the limb, circumferentially up the limb, again, about a 50% overlap. Now we're to the elbow joint. Now we're going to bridge as much of that segment proximal to the elbow joint as we can with this big bulky wrap. Okay. Now, case in point, you look at that and you're like, wow, that, that, this next layer, uh, that's just not the right dimension for me to work with. So what I've done is I've thinned that out um, uh, to, to work with this particular roll here. And it's still a little bit wider than I want, so I'm just going to pull it apart. 
And so again, showing you that you can, you can easily do with your hands what, what can take you forever to accomplish with a pair of scissors or a scalpel blade. So I'm trying to essentially have a uniform diameter, kind of proximal to distal. And you probably saw there that as I was applying uh, tension to this layer, the, the, the cotton just tore. So again, I'm, I'm really not at uh, particular risk of getting this layer too tight because it simply won't let, me, uh, won't let me do that. Another thing probably worth showing is for this particular exercise, and this happens sometimes in your clinic and mine as well, I didn't have an assistant. So look at what I did is I used the stirrups and I just used a towel clamp or a hemostat to attach them to my scrubs. Or if you're using a hemostat, you can just go through your belt loop. If you're wearing just a pair of khakis or jeans or something like that, just go through your belt loop to secure to the stirrup. And so it's just a way of saving a pair of hands. You know, sometimes it's like, you know, I don't have 20 minutes to wait for somebody to be available. I need to keep moving on. And so I like to give you little tricks that'll help you uh, to do that. So now we're using the gauze layer. This is four inch gauze. Given this bulky of a bandage, if I had access to six inch gauze, I'd probably use that. I think that'd probably even be better. Um, two inch would be a little bit of a train wreck. It'd be hard to work with. So I'm glad that I have at least four inch gauze. Again, I'm putting a lot of tension on there, but I'm only doing it because this is a Robert Jones bandage, right? Is there's a lot of cotton for me to compress. I would never pull gauze that tight with any other bandage, only a Robert Jones. And as I'm doing it, again, I'm applying a counter torque with my right hand. It probably is worth discussing why am I wrapping in the direction that I'm wrapping. It's really only because I'm left-handed. Um, so I'm more comfortable wrapping in that direction. I could just as easily wrap in the opposite direction. You know, we talk, I think, about in horses that maybe the direction that you wrap is important. And I don't really know. I'll plead my ignorance in that regard. But I don't know of any significance to the direction of your application of a wrap um, in small breeds of dogs. So the only reason I'm wrapping in the direction I'm wrapping is I'm left-handed and that's what's most comfortable to me. So we'll kind of speed this video up a little bit because I think you get the basic sort of theme of what's going on there. So we'll kind of continue that process. Zip, zip, zip. And all the while, though, you can see I am working to not get any constricting bands or kinks. I mean, yes, I do have a, a, a nice bulky Robert Jones bandage, so I'm less worried about constricting bands with the gauze. But I think it's just a good habit to have is, is nice uniform tension, no constricting bands. So now we're going to separate those two pieces of tape. Some people like to put a little tongue depressor between the tape to make this exercise a little bit easier. I typically do what you saw here is I just have little folded over tabs at the end of the tape stirrups to help get them apart. And then I, I struggle a little bit to get them apart, but typically not a problem. So there you can see the center two digits protruding out the very distal end of the bandage. We're going to take that tape stirrup. We're going to twist it 180 degrees. So now that it's adherent, to the outer surface. We're going to do the same thing with the other stirrup. And now I'm going to run and get those that elasticon so that I can put those little elasticon strips over the end of the bandage. So we'll rush me around the table here a little bit. Let's cut a few strips. Okay. Maybe another one. Three strips will usually do it. Sometimes you might need four. And then I'm just going to use those to kind of seal in all of that cotton, okay? Just so there's not cotton sticking out the end of the bandage that looks a little bit goofy to the owner. It, it's eye-catching uh, to the patient as well, and they kind of want to start futzing with the cotton and chewing at it. So it's just going to be, give things a little bit more of a polished look. Put on a third one, see how that looks. So not too bad. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take our uh, vet wrap and we're going to do, as I said before, I'm going to apply a little bit more tension to this wrap. 
than I would with any other bandage. And this is a calculated maneuver, right? I mean, you know, you're, it's hard. I sit here and look at this video now and I, I say, gosh, is that too much tension? But it, 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 only the, the person who's applying the bandage really knows how much um, tension they're applying. But suffice it to say <clears throat> that this amount of tension I would not apply if I had substantially less cast padding. So we'll kind of speed this along. We'll get up to the very top end of the bandage. And here you've got a decision to make is I don't really want to have vet wrap above the padding because I don't want the vet wrap to be constricting. On the other hand, I sometimes like to have the cosmesis of, of having vet wrap kind of seal that in. So what I'm doing now is there's no tension on that vet wrap at all. I'm just laying it on the dog and it's allowing me to take a layer of vet wrap and just fold it over that padding to create, again, a little bit of a seal on the top margin of the bandage as well. And we can thump that baby and it, it thumps like a nice ripe watermelon. Last little tip for you is particularly if you're in an emergency care setting, I would recommend that you put some sort of notification right on the bandage. So this bandage is not a definitive treatment. See your vet by and you list some specific date. So then whether they read your discharge instructions or not, they have this thing staring them in the face and they just can't avoid it, that this is not the definitive treatment. This was mostly or, or primarily exclusively perhaps a, a first aid application. So that's probably a great time to pause and see if there are any questions from the audience. It looks like there's uh, no questions yet um, for you, Ross. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I guess I had a, a question for you, if you wouldn't mind. Okay. Um, you know, what do you think of the most errors? You know, when you were in practice, you were going to a lot of clinics and maybe seeing some of these applied. What do you think were the most common pitfall, pitfalls that you saw? Yeah, it, one of them is the one I mentioned is that, um, and it's worth mentioning again because it happens so commonly, is bridge the joint above and the joint below. And so all too often I see with a Robert Jones bandage that it's, it's basically applied at the level of the injury. And that's doing no good. It, it now it's just a heavy pendulum. It, it's it's not helping matters. It's arguably possibly making matters worse. So bridge the joint above the joint below. Um, I, I think other more subtle errors I see is that people don't apply enough compression with their Robert Jones bandage. So making sure starting at the cotton layer. That, that bulky cotton layer that, that we get it nice and snug and then the subsequent layers uh, appropriately snug um, as well. And then maybe the last one is, is, is uh, um, just where it's like, ah, this dog really would have benefited from the eight minutes that it takes to apply a Robert Jones bandage and you didn't do it. And so this dog is, is experiencing a lot more discomfort than it needs to be experiencing. There's more swelling. It's going to complicate the surgery. Uh, maybe there's an open wound that wasn't managed. You know, th those things, um, you know, what you do in those first you know, 8, 12, 24 hours really does set the stage for what's going to happen over the next few months. So I guess that'd be my, my best answer to that question. Great. And one more, if you don't mind. Um, yep. I kind of feel like in my training that the, the Robert Jones, the true Robert Jones, as you, you know, nicely showed in the video, was kind of a little bit of a lost art and that, you know, more people move to like a, a soft padded, which, you know, different materials, different, um, maybe utility, maybe, maybe you could speak to that as far as clarifying that utility, um, versus a true Robert Jones. Yeah. I, you know, the problem with just a purely soft padded bandage is, is there is so little padding that you really can't generate the amount of compression that you want that will provide the amount of first aid immobilization that you want. So if you're going to go the soft padded route, that's where I would recommend incorporating a splint. And that's, that's actually probably a good segue because the next section we're going to talk about is first aid splinting. And it'll actually start 
with a soft padded bandage and we'll incorporate a splint into that. So, so maybe I'll use that as my segue. Great. Thank you. So yeah, let's, 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 uh, go on and talk about first aid splinting. And there, there are, a you know, a couple of different basic options. And one is, is using a pre-manufactured splint and you've all seen splints like these and there's others of course um, but these are off the shelf and i think oftentimes people are attracted to these because they seem cheap and easy and and i would actually kind of argue against that the the other option is custom molded splints and it's a really easy skill to master and i i prefer the custom molded splints because i i think that they fit the patient better um you know here we have a photo of a dog with one of the pre-manufactured splints well well that's a that's a photo from somebody who's selling those splints um i find oftentimes they don't fit my patients all that well the other thing is, is, is you need to have a right and a left, and you need to have a small, a medium, and a large. You need to have a front leg and a back leg. So these start taking up quite a amount of space in the clinic, and I've got money tied up in these supplies that are sitting around doing nothing, waiting for a so-so fit. So I, I think it makes sense from a patient care perspective, from a storage space perspective, from an economic uh, perspective within the practice uh, to learn how to do nice custom molded splints. And there's a couple of options to do that. And the first is the use of thermoplastic materials. And, and that um, can be as a perforated mesh, which is what I'm gonna present here, but there's also uh, solid sheets of thermoplastic. But we'll talk a little bit about use of, of these perforated meshes. But the other splinting material option is the use of fiberglass. And, and one isn't necessarily better or worse than another, but they are very different. They have different advantages and disadvantages. You know, there's, there was a study that showed that, that a fiberglass split might give you a little bit more rigidity, but particularly when we're talking about first aid splinting, um, it, it probably is an insignificant advantage. So I think really the choice between thermoplastic and fiberglass is going to boil down to some of this comparison uh, of each of their different features. So let's talk a little bit about um, thermoplastic. And so here's a common brand, uh, Vet Light. And in fact, our, our uh, sponsor this evening, Jorvet, uh, this is what they provide. And when you use these thermoplastic meshes, uh, it requires a hot water bath. And typically what is used in a lot of clinics is just a very affordable electric kitchen skillet. You might make sure you take your dinner out of there first, um, but you're going to put some water in there. You're going to set the dial uh, to a little bit above 160 degrees Fahrenheit or 71 degrees centigrade. Uh, you know, heat it up for two to three minutes. And then when you put this material in there um, uh, and again, soak it for a minute or two or three, um, it's going to be nice and pliable and easy, easy to handle with the exception of it's going to be hot. All right. So you're going to want to handle it with tongs. So again, get yourself some kitchen tongs. I typically put on a couple of pair of gloves um, just because it's, it's hot. Um, one of, and to me, that's a little bit of a disadvantage, right? Another disadvantage is that hot water bath. I, I have to set it up, takes a little bit of time. Um, I've never had it happen in my practice, but I always worry about it. Is that hot water skill? It's a bit of a liability, isn't it? You know, it's you got a you got a cord hanging off the end of your treatment table. People are running around, dogs are running around, and and, and I'm actually quite surprised that I've never scalded, uh, you know, one of my team members or one of my patients just from an accident in the clinic. So that's a negative to them. A huge positive, a huge advantage is if you don't like the way it's molded, you can just pop it right back in the hot water and you can remold it. Or if it's starting to set up and it's getting a little bit tough to cut with scissors, again, you can heat it right back up and it becomes very easy to cut with scissors. Now, with any of these splints, whether we're talking fiberglass or thermoplastic, you're going to need to use multiple layers and you want those layers to meld together. So, in other words, if you have six layers on top of one another, don't let them function as six independent layers. Take the time to meld uh, 
and, and create adherence between each of those layers so that it functions as a unit. Fiberglass casting materials, again, Jorvet and others can, can provide you with a fiberglass casting material. They come in different sizes, 2-inch, 3-inch, 4-inch, etc. Um, advantage of fiberglass casting materials is it does not require a hot water bath. So you don't have that setup time. You don't have that liability, etc. Do know that the setup time of that fiberglass material is proportional to the temperature of the water. So if you were to use hot water, that stuff is going to set up so fast, you're not even going to be done with it by the time it, it has set. And so my recommendation is that you use room temperature water so that you have a little bit of time to work with it, and then it will set up in relatively short order after that. Something to know about fiberglass as a disadvantage is if you don't like the way it's set, you can't, you can't remold it. If you, if you put it back in the water or you put it in hot water or whatever, you're not going to remold it. You're not going to be able to heat it back up to make it easier to cut. So once that stuff sets, it behaves very differently and that's what you're stuck with. Um, Going back to the thermoplastic mesh, some people like the economy, right, of, of with the thermoplastic you use a splint on this patient, that patient has, has derived all their benefits from the thermoplastic plastic splint, you put the splint on the shelf, and then you got a new patient that comes in two days from now, and potentially you can remold it to the needs um, of, of that new patient. So again, just comparing pros and cons. Um, once again, with fiberglass casting tape, do use multiple layers. A single layer isn't going to get the job done, but make sure that those layers are melded together. You can cut fiberglass quite easily with scissors if you do so before it has set. And so kind of different schools of thought. Some people like to have kind of a, a cruddy old pair of scissors that they don't mind uh, getting a little bit gunked up uh, with the fiberglass and they kind of reserve those for use with the fiberglass. Or sometimes I've got a really nice pair of shears that just cuts through this like a butter. Uh, and so they don't get real gunked up. And so again, a, a little bit your choice, but you can see how nicely I'm cutting the material before it has set up with a, with a nice pair of shears or scissors here. Now, if it has set up ahead of you and you still need to do some of your cosmetic trimming, you can do so uh, with an oscillating saw or a cast cutter after it has set and once it's become a hardened set fiberglass. So again, listing some of the materials that you're going to want to accumulate ahead of time. Again, it's going to depend a little bit uh, upon which splinting material you're using. Um, and again, here in this photograph, you can see uh, a, an old cast cutter. Um, a couple of things to point out about that, but an old cast cutter that can be used uh, for removal of casts or again, kind of modifying some of the, um, uh, the unruly edges of a fiberglass um, splint. One of the things I will point out about that, that old cast cutter is uh, it's probably older than I am. And so sometimes you're like, oh, how much am I spending on these things? But again, you can, you can beat these things into the wall typically. Um, and so that, one's, that one has seen a lot of use over the years. So now in applying the splint, we're going to start with that soft padded bandage that you mentioned, Jason. So um, we're going to have stirrups, just like we uh, talked about before. You may have an assistant that can hold on to those stirrups, or you may need to use the belt loop trick. And now we're going to apply not thick cotton roll, but we're going to apply a, a thinner cotton roll, oftentimes referred to as cast padding. And there's different brands of cast padding. This particular brand uh, is called Specialist Cast Padding, and it's not just for specialists. But uh, um, one of the things I do like about that particular brand is it's got these little ridges within it. And so it can be a really nice guide as to how much tension to apply. You apply enough tension to where those ridges begin to disappear. But it's, it's not a huge point because if, the, if you're pulling too tight, regardless of, the, uh, of what brand of cast padding you're using, again, it's just going to tear. 
Um, again, the principle of wrapping uh, like a snail, as we've discussed. So the goal is very similar, 50% overlap, working your way up the limb, 50% overlap, working your way down the limb, trying to maintain nice, uniform compression, avoiding any constricting bands. And again, admittedly, with the cast padding layer, constricting bands aren't your, aren't your biggest concern. But now when we come to the gauze layer, we are going to again wrap like a snail, 50% overlap. We might go to the crisscross pattern I mentioned with the Robert Jones, if if that appears to be advantageous. But here it's 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 really important to emphasize two things. One is this is much less tension than the Robert Jones bandage. It's snug. Um, it, it's not as if you're just laying it on the limb. It is snug but it's not near the degree of tension that you saw me using with the Robert Jones bandage. That's point number one. Point number two is it's, it's much more important with this soft padded bandage that we have so far that we not get any constricting bands within that gauze layer. Now, when it comes to selecting your thermoplast or your fiberglass, what dimensions do you want to use? My rule of thumb is if I'm a t uh, applying a slab splint, I want roughly a 30% circumference around the limb. Again, rule of thumb. Don't get out a, a ruler. Don't, don't get crazy with it, but, but that'll help you guide you. Do I want a two inch roll? Do I want a three inch roll? Do I want a four inch roll? We've talked about this. We're going to use room temperature water. We're going to soak it. We should emphasize that. The entire roll is saturated and soaked, and then we're going to squeeze it out, shake some of that excess water out of the roll, and then we're just going to uh, apply these sequential layers, proximal to distal overlapping. A word to the wise is expect a little bit of shrinkage. Um, so it's much better to have this splint be a little bit too long because remember, you can always cut it with scissors before it is set or you can use your cast cutter or oscillating saw to cut it after it has set. I'd, I'd rather have it be too long and need to trim it down than end up feeling like, eh, it's shorter than I want, but I'm going to make it work because of economy of time, economy of expense, etc., and I'm not doing my best job. So expect a little bit of shrinkage. Start with it perhaps a little too long, and you can always cut it short. So here's just a really example, a good example of what it ought to look like, is those layers are melded together. What your eye now sees amongst these six layers is, is you see one melded uniform construct, and that is the way that it ought to appear. So this is still moldable at this stage. It's starting to set, but it's still very moldable. Um, I can still cut it with my scissors so I get some of those unruly square edges out of the way. Anything that's going to be irritating above or below the bandage or make me look like I've never applied a splint before. I want to look like a professional in the eyes of my client. And so you can see we've put on some of those cosmetic changes there. And again, as it says here, that splint, while it is beginning to set, it's still got some softness to it. It's still malleable. And the importance of that is, is that now when I apply this gauze uh, once again, so this is a second layer of gauze, but around the splint, now what it's doing is it's getting me this beautiful custom mold of the splint now to the underlying soft padded bandage. We're essentially at my second to last layer, and so we're going to apply our tape stirrups at this point. So notice that the stirrups are attached to the skin at the deepest layer, and they're going around the soft padded bandage, and they're going around the splint. So the splint shouldn't slip, and neither should the bandage. So there you can see what I want to see. I want to see the, the, you know, the nails of the center two digits sticking out. I want to be able to feel uh, for swelling uh, between these two digits, but they're just barely protruding. So I shouldn't get swelling uh, of those digits because of, of, uh, of an error in uh, splint application.
Once again, I tend to use the Elasticon strips to seal the end of the bandage, just like the Robert Jones. And now we're going to apply vet wrap circumferentially, but we're going to do it much more gently than with the Robert Jones. Essentially, we're unwinding it off of the roll and we're just laying it upon the bandage. So be cautious um, uh, not to get it too tight. This is actually one place where you might want to wrap like a drunken snail, because when you wrap like a drunken snail, you, you just can't get as much tension on this layer. Um, but, but the big point is just no tension on the vet wrap um, with soft padded bandages or first aid splints like this. So you can see a nice completed uh, splint there. We've got access to those center to, uh, toes uh, to assess for swelling. Okay. Um, now, uh, upon splint removal, I, I always recommend, no matter what we do, is let's be a student of ourselves, right? Let's critique ourselves. And so you can see when that splint was removed, we look at it and we're like, that's that cosmetically actually is a nice splint. We don't have any sharp edges sticking off this way or that way. It's relatively uniform. Each of the layers is melded together. And I'd venture to say it's about 30% circumference of the limb. So that, that was, a, was a nice job with that particular application. Let's talk very briefly about the spica splint. It really is just a minor variant of what we've talked about with that, la, uh, that slab splint. So here I've got a soft padded bandage, but it continues from the uh, brachial segment above the elbow to then go up and over the shoulder. Now, particularly when applying a spica splint to the thoracic limb, let's make sure we don't get this too tight. Remember, this patient oftentimes is anesthetized, and maybe we're ventilating for the patient, but soon they're going to have that tube pulled, and they're going to have to do their own ventilation. If we get this circumferential chest wrap too tight, they may have respiratory difficulties, ventilatory difficulties upon recovery, and you're always going to want to have your eye out for that because because even though I'm very aware of it, I have made that mistake um, and, and had to respond, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. Um, not absolutely critical, but because I have less soft padded bandaging up over the chest and, and whatnot. Sometimes I'll just apply a trash bag over the patient just so as I'm molding this longer slab splint and it's going up over the midline that I'm just not getting hair attached and things like that. And I just hold it in that position until it has started to set nicely and then I'll lift it up off that trash bag. And so I'll have, at that point, this sort of fiberglass splint. Here's a great case in point, a little bit of an error that you may see in my technique, is it's a little bit short. I didn't allow enough for the shrinkage of that splint. And, and the short end is at the distal end. I think I'm going to be okay, but it makes a good uh, case in point, is it, is it always tends to shorten or shrink on you um, as it's setting. Um, after it has begun to harden, what I tend to do, I, I know I've got good padding on the limb. What I'm less confident of is that I have good padding on the chest. And so I will tend to apply padding on the proximal end of the splint so that uh, I know I've got good padding between splint and patient at that level. Um, then with that padded splint in place, then I'm going to once again use gauze to secure the splint to the soft padded bandage that is on the limb and the soft padded bandage that is around the chest wall of the patient. Here's where you really want to pay attention. The vet wrap. Uh, make sure, because lots of times you're having to lift the patient and go around the patient with the wrap. It's really easy with an anesthetized patient to get this vet wrap too tight. So, so be very, very, very conscious of applying it loosely. And even if you've done a great job with that, I would always recommend have somebody keep an eye on the ventilatory capabilities and effort of that patient when they are extubated. Um, it's not a big deal. If they're having difficulty, all you have to do is cut the vet wrap layer typically. So just cut it over the chest, let it snap apart, and then apply, reapply it in a, in a more loose fashion. So just, just be attentive to it. I just don't want any tragedies in your clinic. So spica splints apply both 
to the front limb as well as the hind limb. And the only variant really is when you're applying them to the front limb, that circumferential wrap around the trunk is primarily caudal to the limb. And when you're applying a spica splint to the hind limb, that circumferential wrap around the trunk is essentially cranial to the hind limb. And it's going to have to be cranial to the prep use in male dogs. Use the last minute or two to talk about aftercare and client education. You know, uh, tell your clients, uh, observe them closely for toe swelling, bandage loosening, soiling, etc. cetera. Um, hopefully in these short-term first aid applications, that's less of an issue than some of our more cr chronic applications where we're using coaptation for uh, definitive management of injuries. Um, let's make sure we protect that bandage from soiling, whether it's soiling in the cage um, or whether it's, uh, you know, getting damp when they're out walking in the backyard, et cetera. And even in an arid climate like Colorado, um, you know, there's more moisture in that grass than you would ever imagine and in that soil. So when they're going outside, I'm going to put some impervious booty over their paw. And so that could be the, the classic IV bag booty that's a little bit ghetto, but is very economical. And it's, if it's just for a day or two, that's going to get the job done. But if I'm using a more uh, definitive sort of uh, application where this patient's going to be wearing this for a longer period of time, it might make sense to use a more uh, uh, professional, commercial, protective boot. And those, those can be really helpful. Obviously, written instructions. A lot of people will put... Uh, uh, you know, illustrations in their instructions or photos in their instructions. Some people online, they'll have video instructions. All of those can be really helpful. But one of the things I do find is it's very dependent upon people reading them. And so just as we mentioned uh, prior to this is, is, you know, rather than relying them to read every word of my written instructions, I just put a, a little sign on the outside of the splint that says, hey, this is a first aid treatment. This is not a final treatment. Make sure you see your vet by uh, and list a specific date. So the take home points from our time together this evening are, uh, you know, a properly applied first aid bandage or splint. It improves patient comfort. It protects wounds if they exist. It prevents wounds if they don't exist. It really does prepare the patient for success. These coaptation skills really are must have. And, and yet, oftentimes we haven't had that much of a chance to work on them in school uh, and to really refine them. You know, I think pictures and, and videos like I showed you can be really helpful resources, but I think hands-on training experience are, are really helpful as well. And so I've listed the dates of some upcoming bandaging courses that we have. And so this particular course is, is almost purely hands-on. You do all your preparatory stuff online, and then you come in and have a very intensive day of hands-on skills. I'll talk a little bit more about what we do in that. Um, and then the, either the day before or the day after the course, there's also a, a separate one-day course that is Mastering Canine Lameness and Ortho Exam. So again, some of these everyday orthopedic skills. So giving you some information about those courses, um, you know, it's a hybrid course design, as I mentioned. You do all the preparatory work. You look at the videos, et cetera, while you're at home. Um, and then when you come in for the hands-on, you're going to get to do the Robert Jones. You're going to apply the splint, work with the different splinting materials. We're also going to manage traumatic hip luxations where you're going to go through the palpation diagnosis. You're going to look at some of the five critical things you want to evaluate on your radiograph when you're looking at a hip luxation that will be not only predictive of the prognosis, but will help you decide how you ought to manage that hip luxation and if closed reduction is indicated. If it is, one of the things we'll practice in the course is how do you do that um, so that you feel comfortable performing a closed reduction? And then how to apply an Emer sling for that closed reduction of the hip um, with, a, with a little improvement that we call the abduction roll. And as I say, that, that hands-on course can be paired uh, with a course either the day before or day after on, on mastering canine lameness and ortho exam. So I think I've, I've burned up the better part of our hour together. Do there happen to be any questions from the audience? Looks like uh, you must have uh, hit all the high points. Um, nothing came in through the chat. So, um, um, and I think, uh, hopefully I can speak for all those tuning in tonight. I definitely uh, 
after even doing this for what I think is a long time, still pick up on some uh, some tips. Um, so thanks for sharing those uh, with us tonight. Um, I did have one question. It did look an awful lot like young Dr. Palmer was wearing this a shirt that looks an awful lot like today's Dr. Palmer. I was wondering if you kept that one around for uh, for today's webinar. So, so actually, I, I I missed the question. My audio cut out for a second. Hit me with that one again. Oh, I just said young Dr. Palmer looked a lot like um, today's Dr. Palmer shirt and all. So yeah, 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 exactly. I might pull out the thin tie as well. Yeah. So yeah, maybe it's a classic style. Yeah, uh, maybe just one practical question, you know, um, you know, going through both the Robert Jones and the splint, you know, how do you decide, you know, is it based on what you have in your practice or caseload? If you had that tibia you showed coming in, yeah, which are you gonna? Which are you, gonna uh, you know, I, I'll be honest, um, and, and you may have a different opinion, but I, I feel like properly applied, I'm happy with either. Um, so I, I really do think that some people, you know, they don't, they only have the supplies for one or the other in their clinic, or maybe they have the supplies for both. But but uh, you know, a lot of people are like, I'm comfortable with this, and I'm not comfortable with that. So so I'm not gonna personally, I'm not gonna make a big thing of I think you should do this or you should do that. Uh, just do one of them and do it well. But that's my perspective. I don't know if you have different thoughts. I, I would agree, you know, when it comes to bandaging or fracture fixation or whatever, um, you know, doing one way well, um, better than trying something new and having a complication um, if, if equal um, options exist. So um, I probably lean on the splint more than the Robert Jones, but um, it's always fun to, to get a little sweat on the forehead uh, applying one of those properly. So very good um, well thanks it's been a pleasure to be with you this evening and uh hopefully it's been helpful to those of you who tuned in great um just a couple of closing notes for those uh still tuned in um again thanks to dr palmer for uh the uh, invigorating um session practical tips and pointers super helpful for everyone i know i speak for probably many here um that you know the willingness to kind of cover some of these everyday topics is greatly appreciated uh, for, for um, things we're going to see on a daily basis. Uh, special thanks to Jorvet, uh, who was the sponsor for this webinar episode. And then again, just to refresh on a couple of the dates that were on those last slides, uh, Dr. Palmer and colleagues will be doing the hands-on training courses every day, orthopedic skills here at the CSU Translational Medicine Institute in Fort Collins in January. I invite you to check those out at CSU Vet ce.com. Uh, again, one day mastering canine lameness and orthopedic exam skills on the 22nd of January, followed by a one day orthopedic first aid training, bandages and splints, casts, open wounds, and more. Um, that course is on the 23rd. So I've had to guess uh, many of you probably could fit in a little uh, business and pleasure, learn about some orthopedic um, management of cases and spend a couple of days up at Breckenridge uh, while you're here. So uh, thanks again for joining us. Uh, next month, we'll continue um, the tune-up um, of Everyday Orthopedic Skills session uh, series. That episode is going to focus on evaluating the lame dog. Um, that one's going to be on Wednesday, October 5th at 7 p.m. Eastern time, um, 5 p.m. those here in the mountains. We look forward to seeing you then. In the meantime, remember you're more than a learner, you're a whole person. Take care of yourself and let's look out for each other. Have a good evening.